Outlook3.com. Today is July 21st, 2016. This is the Black Star Update Report connected to volume 29 of Terrell's 2016 newsletter. Seismic, volcanic, and magnetic North Pole migration indicators all say that Earth continues moving through the first Earth change low period for the 2016 Earth orbit cycle relative to the Black Star moving left in the orbit diagram from the feet of the Virgo constellation into Libra just, to, just below the ecliptic plane relative to the Sun. The year-over-year -year seismic values for week 23, this is for 2014, this is 2015, and you can see many of the same values for 2016. My prediction for three of the six magnitude earthquakes was right on, and whenever you go back and look at the 2014-2015 seismic chart, you just go down to week 23 here, it's more uh, well pronounced in 2000. You see all the threes here? Three, three, three. Here we had two. So through this period between 20 and 25, it's pretty easy to predict there's going to be about three. Six magnitude earthquakes. And uh, we're seeing many of the same values. This is 29. See, we saw 28. Here, uh, let's see, 2015. See this 28 right here for week 20. Then we saw a little lull. There's another 28. This is very common from mid to high. 20s. It's going to be in the 20s pretty much right in this period. But then notice when we get down to, uh, before we get to the lull, these, these could very easily jump up into the 30s. These five magnitude earthquakes right here. Because before we get to this, these minimum values, these minimum values at outside orbit position, that's what we saw for the last, that's what we've seen from the beginning actually. Uh, with the five magnitude earthquake being sub 20 right at outside orbit position that's what we're looking for again and uh, that should I mean it should be right in week 30 on this cycle if the uh, repulsion model is accurate that's what we're testing right now and we're going to go to outside orbit position let me show you in the solar system the black star is going to be in this area see that where the plane cuts Libra and Virgo Black star is going to be in this area right in here. And when we draw that line down, make a 90, that's where Earth is moving towards outside orbit position. It's going to be about right, right in, right about in here, October the, uh, August the 18th, August the 19th, something like that. And we make this 90 degree angle. And that's whenever the, see, the Earth has raced from alignment in April to outside orbit position in August. So Earth's moving away from the black star. Magnetic portal connection is lengthening. Thus, the low period. Then, as after we get beyond the middle of August, we're going to start moving this way, coming behind the sun relative to the black star. And so, whenever we're moving through this period here, this is the same direction the black star is coming. So, the magnetic portal connection is going to be shortening again. And um, that's when our Earth change uptick period. They come on two parts of the solar system from this side over here. Until we come into alignment with the black star and this side over here when the black star is moving towards us. Then when we pass behind the sun relative to the black star into November, that's when we're going to see a lot of more big earthquakes. So we're in an earth change low period and we're going to be watching. We're in week 23 now. Week 24 will end this Saturday. And then for uh, the week 25 is whenever we're expecting to see another 7 magnitude earthquake. And if we go to the seismic chart, then you can see that right here. See that one? In the seven magnitude, then we saw two sevens in three week period in 2015. And we go back to 2014, scroll up, leading up, you see right here, there's the one in week 25. So we didn't get a second one in 2014, but both years, week 25, we saw a seven magnitude earthquake. So don't be surprised if in the next two weeks that we see a large. One of these larger earthquakes, even though we're in the lull period, and some people jump up and down and go, hey, we had a 7 in the lull, but those kind of things happen. I can't tell you exactly why these things happen, why the patterns exist, but I can show you the pattern, and through that, help you to predict what's coming next. So, um, you know where we are in the solar system? The uh, And... That's the point that I'm making in the report right here. Leading up to week 30, when you go back, leading up to week 30, you see these high numbers? The 533 for the 2.5 to 4 magnitude earthquakes in week 27. Following, see the 7 here and the 7 here, following these pair of 7s that came through? So 
we saw 21 in week 23 and that the, for the five magnitude earthquakes and that number jumped up to 28 which we had this week and 29 and 32 and 30 before reaching our sub uh, 20 values at outside orbit position so this pattern has persisted since the beginning and this gives us a strong signal that we're reaching at outside orbit position so don't be surprised if you see larger numbers the fives that are in the now in the 20s don't be surprised if they don't jump up into the 30s and uh, a lot of threes even in 2015 2014 three six magnitude earthquakes and then nothing for a week but then three then nothing you see all these threes that are showing up in here so it's pretty easy to say that uh see all the way let's see week 22 to week 24 last year we saw three each week so we, that could very well happen this time i don't know for the week that's coming up so we reached uh the sub 200 values for the 2.54 magnitude earthquakes in week 23 and 24 and then jumped up to 328 and then 533. You see these, they, I have asterisks by them, question marks by them. Is this real? So don't, let's go back and look at 2014, see if we had something similar, 2014. And you see right here, week 25, you see the 324? That's a jolt. We appear to be getting this jolt that sends our uh, 2.54 magnitude earthquakes from, the two, from about 200. What do we have this week, 205 or 207? and up into the 300s before eventually we see two weeks of sub 200 values near outside orbit position again so that's the pattern that i'm looking for and I'm, like i said before i'm seeing a lot of values in the chart that are similar from uh, pr from from previous years so that's yeah that's a look at the seismic chart then um, we're on the low side with the new volcanic eruptions the kilauea and then th this is a signal of the pressure that is shifting from Indonesia over to the Americas. In fact, that it's moving through Kilauea. And then Papua New Guinea, that's north of Australia. Remember last week it was the Philippines. So this is even a little further south. This is a retreat of the northern and southern magma waves I'm telling you about. Let's look at the um, earthquake situation. So the pressure wave is moving and I saw another one of these deep earthquakes. Let's, let's Let me just show you the depth. Here for a second see this baby right here 563 is almost to the transition zone over here in the in the sandwich islands over here it's you know it's pretty close to that but then uh, let's see whenever we move this a little bit higher let's get back in the magnitudes put everything back on the earth where it's easier to see so far i'm not seeing any sixes for to get our three for next week so anyway the the pressures originate over in this area and that's where Papua New Guinea is in the origination zone so during the uptick period this pressure shifts north through Alaska and along the south side through the Sandwich Islands over into South America now look let's look at the depths again and for the last week there's nothing over here that is Wait a minute. Here's what you see that bit that deep earthquake right there. What's the depth on that baby? It's 598 kilometers. That's a little bit of activity that's down in the transition zone of the mantle. This generally is hope, happening during the earth change uptick period. The fact that we're seeing these two deeper earthquakes through the low period, this is a warning sign of what's coming once the earth change uptick period does start. So I'm seeing more news about what's going on in Mexico. The pressures, this is where the pressure wave stalled in the last earth change uptake period and the retreat is taking place, but it is not from this side moved back over into South America. We can, I mean, into the into Indonesia, the Australian side of the Pacific Ocean Ring of Fire. That's why we've seen Guatemala. We've seen multiple volcanic eruptions for previous week here in Central America. It's as if the pressure wave stalled at the Southern coast of Mexico. And I'm expecting that pressure to continue to shift north. So let's expect to hear from Arizona. This, uh, the volcanologists, seismologists, and those people becoming more concerned. That's going to come after the earth change uptick period is underway. So let's say November and December coming up. I believe that you're going to see more of this pressure moving north. And you're going to see more and more people concerned in Arizona. Because these people are the... Uh, these are the canaries in the coal mine for the entire uh, 
US Canadian West Coast. These are the people that are going to be sounding off first because the pressure wave from the south is moving more rapidly than the one coming around from the north. If it was turned around, then we'd expect to hear from the Canadians more. But this is the area that's locked out here in Cascadia, and the pressures jumping across into the Americas came from the 600 kilometer deep earthquake activity in this area jumping over to this area first. So this is the pattern that I expect to continue. And uh, it's just not as easy to identify during the low period. Earth core is definitely cooling down through this period. And on previous orbit cycles, we did not see this activity along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That's still showing up during the, we have a month to go in the low period, and it's still persistent. So that's telling me the pressure shift from Indonesia over to the Americas, this is well underway. It's just that because of the little lull, it's not as easy to, easy to identify. But the activity on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge tells me that not only do we have this pressure shifting around this way and coming around this way, but all this pressure coming over to the Americas is having an influence as this is becoming more and more, instead of regional Pacific Ocean Ring of Fire, it's becoming more global. Because this line of earthquakes that run from Nepal across through the Middle East, see, it, it's still recognizable in the lull period. And it was terminating at the Rock of Gibraltar right here during the Earth Change uptick periods. That is not happening any longer. Before, well, what, during the uptick period, we're seeing this Gibraltar activity. There's nothing there now. But we get into the Earth Change uptick period, this line is going to reform. And what's going, and then usually after that, the Mid Atlantic Ridge starts to kick off. This is staying active through here. So that means whenever we get, yeah, we're going through the lull, but Earth core is not cooling down as much as it has on previous orbit cycles. So that when it starts up again, then this activity looks like that it's going to kick off again. And likely, by the time we're passing behind rel the sun relative to the black star, we're going to see more of this activity around Iceland and up towards. Uh, uh, Mount Dutch, if you want to Google uh, Dutch Sense, this is the super volcano that he found up here. It could be that that's going to become more active too. It's just because we're in the low period. The, uh, the fact that Earth is naturally moving around the sun, the way that Earth naturally moves around the sun, we're two astronomical units, 180 million miles closer to the black star in April than we are in November. It's because the Earth is racing away and then coming behind the sun relative to the black star. So if it's moving slower and slower and slower, the fact that we're moving away is having a more dramatic, we're moving 66,000 miles per hour around the sun. The black star is the one that's slowing down. So that's the slight pattern change that I'm expecting. And I mentioned in this uh, report about Jupiter. You're going to hear more and more about Jupiter. Notice that it's entering. The, uh, I'm, I'm looking at August now. Let's get back at the actual time. It's uh, entering the Virgo constellation, and the black star is in the Virgo constellation. The black star, the Jupiter is moving 30 degrees left in the orbit diagram each year. Black star moved only 3 degrees. So that means even if the black star is getting closer to the sun, I believe that it's coming in along this line, like this, and then as it gets closer to the sun, it's actually being repelled by the sun. So it's elliptical orbit transitioning into a circular orbit around Venus orbit path. And if you go out to the, the uh, I didn't pull up the program, but if you go out and look from Earth, then you're going to see Mars. You're able to see Mar uh, after you go outside, say it's 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, Jupiter is closer to the horizon. Mars is higher in the sky. Our, from our relative position, we're looking at the black star, which is just to the right of Mars. Because remember, we're on the inside track. We're passing Mars. It's retrograding, not Relative to the sun, Mars is, act, is going around the sun just like the other planets. But because we're moving faster, Mars appears to be backing up. So from our perspective, right here, it appears to be in the Libra constellation. When relative to the sun, it is actually in Sagittarius. You see? So when you go out at night, you can find Mars very easily. And the black star is just to the right of Mars. It's retrograding also, again, because Earth is moving around the sun. If you can see it, if you can see the black star. And to my knowledge, there are no pictures of the black star. You cannot capture the black star using regular photography, using a, even an ast a, uh, astronomy class telescope. It's impossible. You look right at it and not see it because it's sitting inside of that deep gravity well. Micro lensing is perfected and uh, it's super cold and it's only three to five kilometers in diameter. So even if it wasn't a high mass object, then we would have difficulty seeing this darn thing. But it's encased in an event horizon. And microlensing means when you look directly at it, you see the stars in the distance. 
micro, uh, gravitational lensing effect is perfected. So I'm getting a little criticism for not opening up the research, broadening the research, going, you know, looking at everything that everybody's saying. Because in my view, a lot of disinformation, a lot of misinformation that's out there. A lot of dupes are out there. Two sun pictures. They think that's the stuff. You know, it's the bling bling, as uh, Steve Olson says. But I've had a few conversations with Steve, and uh, he's 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 getting it. He's he's slowly getting it. I think the guy is genuine. He um he's he's truly he knows something is coming. He's looking for evidence to show you. He's trying to be helpful. It's just we have our own astronomer. We have our own observatory class telescope, infrared equipment. We know where the black star is, and we know we cannot photograph it. We know we can't photograph it. And these two sun pictures, no matter where the Earth is, let's just imagine, because we can see Jupiter. We can see it loud and clear, right? Okay, so whenever the Earth passes behind the sun relative to Jupiter, you can get the sun and Jupiter in the same picture. You know, if Jupiter was bright enough so that we could see it through the lit atmosphere. But this is the time to get the two pictures. But whenever the Earth is over here, you're not going to get two pictures. You're not going to get a picture with Jupiter and the sun in the same frame. It's impossible. You're going to be getting a frame like this, and Jupiter's outside the frame. And obviously, whenever we're between the two stars, when we're between Jupiter and the sun, somebody try to explain to me how you're going to get a picture of Jupiter and the sun in the same frame. You're sitting on Earth, looking at the sun in one direction, and Jupiter in the opposite direction. Well, the same is true for Saturn and Mars, all the planets that are outside Earth orbit path, including the black star. So there's only one time of the year that you could possibly get the sun and the black star in the same frame. So we know that the black star is in this area. So if we bring the Earth on around, you can see that that's going to be in November. And it's going to be in this time of the year. You can just look down below and see how the dates are changing. It's within that time window that you'd have the sun and the black star. However, go out on the Internet. When the, sun's, when the Earth is here, or the Earth's here, or the Earth's here, these people have got two sun pictures every darn day. Because they are getting lens flare anomalies, part of the lens. And they're capturing smaller versions of the sun or any bright object. Any bright object is going to influence, it's going to come through the lenses and it's going to create reflections, refracted light, false images. And uh, these videos that some people send me, I look at them and they're obvious, obvious lens flares, obvious. Sometimes you get sun dog. One out of ten times an anomaly they're looking at is a sun dog. Naturally occurring phenomenon. And uh, you can get those with the right atmospheric conditions. But the two sun thing, if they were real, you would get them in a narrow window about a month of the year. And if it's of the black star, it would be in November. It would be November and December. I mean, you can rule out every other month. The fact that you have them coming every day, every week, every month, means that there's something else. Therefore, there's only so many hours in the day, and I'm trying to run a science-based investigation. It's primary earth changes. The Earth changes. The Earth is testifying. Now Jupiter can testify. Mars has been testifying with the dust storms. And Jupiter's complexion is changing because of the melting, the liquefying of the core. Just Google Jupiter's, Jupiter's liquefying core. And you'll see it came out about 2011, 2012. Jupiter, the core was already liquefying because the ethanes and methanes, they are transitioned whenever they heat up, like Earth core is heating up, they transition directly to gas. And that changes the complexion of the gas giant. That's what's happening. So in my view, the, the Juno probe is never going to be able to build a baseline. It's too late for that. Jupiter's already been changing for more than a decade. If they were really going to be serious about this, they would have sent the probe 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Get your baseline data whenever the red dot, whenever the red storm was still there. It's already changing. Can't see the red dot, the red storm anymore. So they're not going to build a baseline of information. They're going to show you how Jupiter is in transition. It's changing. Not because of the overactive sun. Remember, the scientists are saying that it's going into a modern minimum. That's one explanation. They think we're going to an ice age, even though it gets hotter every darn year. It's getting hotter in Jupiter every year for Jupiter and all the planets in the inner solar system because the black star is siphoning electromagnetism from the sun and redirecting it through a secondary set of magnetic portal connections. Same amount of electromagnetism near solar maximum but the sun doesn't show signs of it. It's invisible, like the black star. You cannot see the magnetic portal connections that's carrying the energy. Electromagnetic energy from across the entire electromagnetic spectrum is channeled through that magnetic portal connection. 
They call it a magnetic portal connection because the a magnetic part of it, the subatomic particle part, is what they can wrap their heads around. It's what they can understand. They don't realize these conduits, many different kinds, and it's conducting energy across the entire spectrum. So that's why the planets are heating up, even though the sun appears to be going to sleep, because it's the sun, the black star is robbing the energy from the sun and redirecting it through the magnetic portal connections. And the planets are heating up because of it. By the time that the black star gets right next to the sun, after the Earth black star crossing event, the sun is going to turn black. And there's a story in this newsletter about big, gigantic coronal hole, which we, we've been hearing that, hearing that, that's formed on the sun right now. And that is more evidence that there's an interloper in the inner solar system. It's siphoning energy from the sun. The only thing that can cause a magnetopause reversal for 28 hours, like March 12, 2012, is the influence of a nearby star inside the pressure shock of our solar system. That's the only way. And the influence, the other star, is the black star that we're tracking. That's why the event happened in March in 2012 when the black star was in this, it was in this area. It's moving left in the orbit diagram this way like all the planets. And that's why it happened in April 2016, because Mars had come over this way, which Mars has been going around, but Mars, every four years, comes into alignment with the Sun, the Earth, and the Black Star. It's on a four-year cycle, 2012, 2014, in Virgo, April, you see. that this. See, I've got it set on April 2017. Look where the Sun is, between, I mean, the Earth is, between the Sun and Virgo. See, so this is is a lot of evidence that's saying that there's a magnetic slash gravitational anomaly that's moving through our solar system. I'm identifying it as the invisible collapsed binary twin to our sun that we can't see. But there's plenty of evidence that's telling us that. But whenever I start trying to go to these two suns and these optics, these pictures and things, then it diminishes what we're doing with through the earth changes. It's, these are opposing doctrines if you will. And there's only one truth. My job is to give, this is what I feel my job is for my YouTubers, newsletter subscribers, and radio listeners, is to give you the truth from the perspective of the Project Black Star investigation. If you want to know more about Project Black Star, read the Dakota Report. Just Google Dakota Report. And you can put CIT on there. The CIT brats are the ones that have posted online. Read it. Read the operations section and everything about Project Black Star. Because that's it's a big giant deal. They know this thing is coming, and th this is the plan that's already in place. My investigation is from that perspective. If you want to put Steve Olson, you want to put Astral Travelers, Strategic Observers, Dutch Sense, Mary Greeley, these are different. These are investigations, research, and sharing coming from a different perspective. So yes, we can all work together. That would be great. I would love it if that was to happen. But your duty as a researcher, as one that's figuring out what's going on, is to listen to everybody. I get that. We'll do that. That doesn't mean that, that I'm going to lean on Nancy Leader. I've read every single thing on that website. It did back in 2011 and 12 when I was building a baseline of data for this, for making my own reports. But I found very little useful over there. Yes, they're tell, saying to prepare. Their idea of a safe zone location is far, vastly different from mine. So there are some similarities there. If you want to go there, you want to invest your time in doing that, more power to you. You know, go for it. But that, I've eliminated that aspect as being important. Yes, there are a few things that I think that they do good over there, but my focus is on the Earth changes and what the Earth, the Sun, Jupiter, that, that's what my focus is. And I apologize if it's kind of boring, but I'm not a rabbit hole digger that runs around, jumps in the holes, and leads you guys everywhere. I'm focused on the birth pangs of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, start at verse 1. The destruction comes suddenly like the birth pangs upon a woman with child. <coughs> oh, pardon me. And I'm monitoring those birth pangs and making weekly reports about it to let you know. Oh, I got something in my throat. Oh, pardon me. That was hurting. Um, so anyway, I want a brief explanation there because some people, particularly Bonnie, who I just love to death, is a little bit angry with me. She's uh, She investigates, like May does, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. And again, more power, you guys. Very proud of you for doing that. And submit to me and... You think that I don't go look at your links. I do. I look at everything. But some of it is useful and some of it is not useful from the position, the perspective of Project Black Star. And my path, that's my path. So be thankful that someone is walking just that path and not trying to integrate everything into that. Like some of these guys. You know, they're doing that. So in one way, maybe it's kind of boring and it's kind of limited. But on the other way, when you stand, whether it's the scriptural stuff, 
or the 9-11 stuff. That's my perspective, and that's where I'm going to stand. That's, where I'm, that's the perspective that I'm going to share from. You can help change the narrative by sending me information, and then with commentary or without commentary, I will post that in the newsletter and let everybody else make up their own mind. Happy to do that. Love to do that. So every single thing you see in my newsletter, I don't necessarily agree with. But a lot of information is coming from a lot of different areas, and I at least want you to be able to see that, that information that I feel. So I'm the editor. And so the things that I feel that are going to be helpful to help you to wake up and prepare, those are the things I'm going to share. So I just wanted to share that with you just a little bit. I got a little bit of concern. And uh, another concern that, yes, and I agree with Sheldon that a lot of my stuff is repetitive. It really is. And I know that it is. It's kind of boring. And that's another request to maybe broaden things, you know, make it more. But I'm not an entertainer. This is science. Just re pick up any book on astronomy, astrology, on, on astronomy, uh, geology, you know, the psychology. This is all boring stuff. It's really, really boring. And um, I do my best. It's more important to me to disseminate and to share so that the largest percentage of the population can understand it. It doesn't do me any good to go in and do all the research and use their terms that most people don't even understand. So this, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm trying to have, find a happy medium in order to do that stuff. And I uh, do this every single day. And um, so I just wanted to address those things. Draw a line. Looking at the magnetic pole migration, draw a line from here to 719. That's two days ago. And notice, you see this 19 right here? This is 719 from last year. Draw this line, and you'll see that we're trailing this year by about two days, two to three days. So the magnetic north pole is now behaving exactly the way that I think it should with the same three-day delay that is in the seismic chart. Remember, it's been 12-day delay for since the investigation started. Now it's just a three-day delay, which I can't quite explain why, other than the elliptical orbit transitioning into a circular orbit. And the magnetic repulsion properties, the characteristics, the relationship between the black star and the sun. So this thing is not coming in along, along the elliptical orbit. It's, a, it's in a transitional orbit and is unlike anything cataloged by the automatic supercomputer. This is something that's different. But there is a science paper out there. Just Google um, Canadian student binary star repulsion. This, is a been, this has been observed, these relationships between the two stars. It's not completely understood, obviously. But the looking at the data... And looking at the binary star, the, the binary star magnetic repulsion modeling, then this is going to explain a lot of things. It's just got to be tweaked. And I'm looking for the new pattern. The black star is going to establish a new pattern. Hopefully, I can recognize the pattern and warn people before it gets here. That's the goal. But if you're following me week for week, as boring as it is, then you're going to get the best information based upon what the Earth is saying, what the planets are saying, what the sun is saying about when the black star is going to get here. I do not know when it's going to get here. May the 20th, 2017 was the drop dead date. It was the right on date. But that was that date was gathered from the elliptical, the modeling including the elliptical orbit. I didn't see this magnetic repulsion thing coming. I couldn't explain why the black star was slowing down, but now I can. And when we went from 12 degrees average moving left in the orbit diagram, the black star was moving 12 degrees like Jupiter's moving 30. This thing was moving 12 degrees left in the orbit diagram each year. Now, last year it moved only three. So, that's why in this modeling, in this magnetic pole migration model, I'm expecting, see September 5th, 2016, this is the 360 line, right here. Last year it hit on September the 8th, I'm expecting this year to hit on September the 5th. We'll see if it's going to happen or not. But if this is exactly what, what it is poised to do at this moment. I couldn't say that back over here, when we're going through this crazy stuff over in April. If you look at the 19th right here, you notice that the black star was ahead of schedule. Things were rocking and rolling. Now it's simmering down, and it looks like that it's going to do the right thing, according to what my theory says, anyway. So we're going to see. Then, uh, so there's pictures here at this link for the new pictures of Jupiter using the Juno probe thingy, and um, this is this is going to be showing that the Jupiter is going to get brighter. The complexion is changing, and I can't wait to hear. What NASA's excuse is, it's got to be an excuse, not a reason, because according to them, we're going into a mini ice age because the sun is going into a modern minimum. So how's the Jupiter heating up with the sun with reduced um, solar output? If it has less output, how can Jupiter be heating up? 
That doesn't make sense. How come the earth gets hotter and hotter every year if the sun's in it at going into a maunder minimum in a, an ice age? Where's any evidence that we're going into an ice age? Any. Zero. There's none out there. It's hot. Look at just look at the weather map. And there's weather plenty of weather maps in this newsletter. But you can just turn on the weather channel and you're gonna see extreme heat everywhere. And there's stories in here about sinkholes that are forming. Giant sinkholes on this planet and at the same time lakes that are disappearing. More evidence that there's an interloper in the inner solar system. Project supporters for this week include Jason and Paula and Sean, three new newsletter subscribers for this week. They uh, supported the research. They have full subscriber benefits. See, just like um, Jason right here and Sandy underneath. And this, oh, this is Michael. Sandy wrote last week. But whenever you make a $25 subscription per year, it's only $25 per year, then you can start sending in these questions and I'm on the hook to go and read see that here's a nancy leader thingy and i'll send you right over there you know go look at it they have some good information on some things some things not so good so when you become a newsletter subscriber you get linked to the dropbox folder you get a notification email has a long video link showing you exactly how everything works and then uh, you can start sending in your questions just like jason did uh-oh i think i'm about to lose this program i sure did let me see if i can get that back up Okay, a little mishap there. Something going on with the system. Let's get this more easy to read here. Then uh, what I was explaining is then you can start sending me your questions and then I'm on the hook. I must answer them. And some of them, so, some of, of the questions and answers are far too personal and things to go into the newsletter. And some people request not to put things in the newsletter, but whenever they can, this is a good example. Then uh, Jason sees the patterns, the three witness patterns in scripture. So I'm going to give, you know, some brief, you know, paragraph or two or three on, uh, he's asking about the keyhole orbit, the transitional orbit path, but I really love that. You can see the Bible stuff and can see the science and the black star stuff, which is also scriptural. Really, really love that. That's going to put uh, your question at the very top of the featured section whenever you have your finger on the pulse of the, of the investigation on what's happening all around us from the Project Black Star perspective combined with scripture. That is, that's right up my alley. I really, really love that. Then Michael's got a question here, and he wants to know the need for a cavern. Why do you need a cavern? Well, when the outside temperatures are 200 to 300 degrees sustained, you're going to need breathable air. Caverns are about 58 to 60 degrees year-round, no matter what the temperature is outside. It's breathable air. Then you've got collapsing magnetosphere. The magnetosphere is compromised, and... The stuff, the bad stuff from space wants to get in. You're not going to be want to running, running around on the surface. The elite are going to the underground arc cities for a reason. This is this duplicates as near as possible what the elite are doing by finding a safe zone location, informing your fellow survivalists, and using the cavern as your home base for a period. Doesn't mean you're going to live there forever. It could be a month, could be six weeks, could be up to six months. But without a cavern. It's possible that you're going to use like train tunnels and things. It's possible. But if you're anywhere near the coast, train tunnels are going to be flooded. So there's a lot of considerations. And uh, if you want something specific, so as soon as you become a subscriber, you can send me the question, where is the closest safe zone for me? What do I need to know? What do I need to do? And things like that. I'm on the hook that give you a specialized, just for you, threat assessment and contingency planning report. Just like uh, every other newsletter subscriber, and tell you exactly what you need to do. And what I, people are asking about joining particular groups. What I'm going to do is give you a location of a well-known cavern that is not far from my safe zone location. That's the place to meet. I know the people there. I've been there several times. My friends have worked there for 30 years, and that's where everybody needs to go. Where is that place? Well, become a newsletter subscriber. And then I'm going to know you for a little while and then share with you that information, let you know where to be. You don't need to go buy a property with a cavern on it, just like you don't need to buy a boat to go fishing. You just need a friend that has a boat, and you just need a friend that has a cavern, People, somebody that you know, somebody that you've met. And whenever the crap hits the fan and you show up, they're going to know you already. And instead of killing you and taking all your survival supplies, they're going to welcome you because you are going to help their support position. You're going to help them defend their location for you and your family and their family. That's the plan. 
that we're going to work on. It is the most economical plan, and it, you just need to know when to be at the right place at the right time. That's what this investigation is about. And um, this next story, well, it's about, I'm running at 40 minutes, though. I'm not really going to have time to get into this. The changes in the jet stream, extremely important. The stuff at the, that's most important is at the top of this newsletter. hope you'll spend some time going through that. And um, if I can get the update done quickly on the radio show today, that starts at 4 o'clock at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, then I'll get into some more of this uh, information that's embedded in the newsletter here. So with that, then um, pretty much share with you everything that I want to share with you. Remember that previous radio shows appear right here, the one from last week, 714, 707. You can go back. You can share it. Please share this newsletter link. It's in the description box. Free link. Share it with your friends. Send it. That's what it's there for. It's on a meter. About 100 people a week share this. They download this uh, newsletter. Share it with anybody that you want. Uh, it's more preferable to me if you would send them the link. That way it registers as one download, and then it gives me a better idea of how many people are actually benefiting, actually going through the information. But there's uh, tons of hours of video, of, of radio shows in here. So every newsletter has a new radio show link. So after the radio show, I'm going to re-upload this. There's going to be a 721 there for today's show. So somebody that doesn't have the time to invest, keeping up with all this research, this is what all you need, in my view. You, need, you want to know the, where the new volcanic eruptions are, where the earthquakes events are, where we are in the solar system, and there is the uh, survival-related information. Only one survival. Oh, this is the uh, radio section. This is a show right here. It's pretty long, lengthy. Oh, the Common Sense Show, Dave Hodges, on the air. But here are 40 things that millennials can't do. Simple stuff. It says shockingly simple stuff that they have no idea how to do. And it's kind of scary. So I'm older. So I was raised on a farm. I know how to do everything on this. Once saved, you can see the tourniquet. Once saved a guy's life with my bandana. He was, he had cut himself, his hand almost all the way off with a, with a chainsaw. It was actually working next door to where I was. I was a bricklayer working on a chimney. And this, this crew came in and they were, they started up all the machines. I mean, it must have been about seven or eight Mexicans. And they're going to town, and all of a sudden, this guy cut himself, and everybody was in shock. Nobody was doing anything. I had to scale down the uh, scaffolding. That was maybe four or five scaffolds high on this tall chimney. And then run over to him, grab him by the wrist, because this guy was going to bleed out. He was going to bleed out in no time. And everybody was standing around him. And then took off my bandana, and those who know me, because I'm a pool shooter from old, old school, and uh, always carry a bandana and I wrapped it around there real tight. Said, hey, you guys, get this guy to a hospital right away. But I'd love to tell that story because I, I'm a firm believer in bandanas. There's a thousand uses just for a bandana, and one of them is to save your own or somebody's life with it. So, um, anyway, I thought this would be interesting for you guys. Should be interested in it. And uh, hopefully, we'll get more survival related information next week from uh, contributors and subscribers. Okay, that's what I want to share with you. And I don't want this to go any longer. I'm going to upload this baby right now. And I'll see you guys at the radio show or on the next Black Star Update Report. Get more information, as always, at the, my website here, terralo3.com. And your subscriptions and your donations, extremely helpful. I appreciate them very, very much. See you guys on the next Black Star Update Report. Hello, YouTube and newsletter subscribers. This is Terrell from terralo3.com. Today is July 21st, 2016. This is the Black Star Update Report connected to volume 29 of Terrell's 2016 newsletter. Seismic, volcanic, and magnetic. North Pole Migration Indicators all say that Earth continues moving through the first Earth change lull period for the 2016 Earth orbit cycle relative to the black star moving left in the orbit diagram from the feet of the Virgo constellation into Libra just, to, just below the ecliptic plane relative to the Sun. The year-over-year -year seismic values for week 23, this is for 2014, this is 2015, and you can see many of the same values for 2016. My prediction for three of the six magnitude earthquakes was right on. And whenever you go back and look at the 2014-2015 seismic chart, you just go down to week 23 here. It's more uh, well pronounced in 2000. You see all the threes here? Three, three, three. Here we had two. So through this period between 20 and 25, it's pretty easy to predict there's going to be about three. Six magnitude earthquakes. And uh, we're seeing many of the same values. This is 29. See, we saw 28 here. Uh, 
Let's see 2015. See this 28 right here for week 20. And we saw a little lull. Here's another 28. This is very common from mid to high 20s. It's going to be in the 20s pretty much right in this period. But then notice when we get down to uh, before we get to the lull, these these could very easily jump up into the 30s. These five magnitude earthquakes right here, because before we get to this, these minimum values, these minimum values at outside world position, that's what we saw for the last, that's what we've seen from the beginning, actually. Uh, with the five magnitude earthquake being sub 20, right at outside world position, that's what we're looking for again. And uh, that should, I mean, it should be right in week 30 on this cycle. If the uh, repulsion model is accurate, that's what we're testing right now. And we're going to go to outside orbit position. Let me show you in the solar system. The black star is going to be in this area. See where the plane cuts Libra and Virgo. The black star is going to be in this area right in here. And when we draw that line down, make it 90. That's where Earth is moving towards outside orbit position. It's going to be about right, right in, right about in here. October the uh, August the 18th, August the 19th, something like that. And we make this 90 degree angle. And that's whenever the, see the Earth has raced from alignment in April to outside orbit position in August. So Earth's moving away from the black star, magnetic portal connection is lengthening, thus the lull period. Then as, after we get beyond the middle of August, we're going to start moving this way, coming behind the sun relative to the black star. And so whenever we're moving through this period here, this is the same direction the black star is coming. So the magnetic portal connection is going to be shortening again. And um, that's when our Earth change uptick period, they come on two parts of the solar system, from this side over here until we come into alignment with the black star, and this side over here when the black star is moving towards us. Then when we pass behind the sun relative to the black star into November, that's when we're going to see a lot of more big earthquakes. So we're in a Earth change low period, and we're going to be watching. We're in week 23 now. Week 24 will end this Saturday. And then for uh, the week 25 is whenever we're expecting to see another 7 magnitude earthquake. And if we go to the seismic chart, then you can see that right here. See that 1 in the 7 magnitude? Then we saw two sevens in 3-week period in 2015. And we go back to 2014, scroll up, leading up, you see right here, there's the 1 in week 25. So we didn't get a second one in 2014, but both years. Week 25, we saw a 7 magnitude earthquake, so don't be surprised if in the next two weeks that we see a large, one of these larger earthquakes, even though we're in the lull period, and some people jump up and down and go, hey, we had a 7 in the lull, but those kind of things happen. I can't tell you exactly why these things happen, why the patterns exist, but I can show you the pattern, and through that, help you to predict what's coming next. So, um, you know where we are in the solar system? The, uh, and that's the point that I'm making in the report right here. Leading up to week 30, when you go back, leading up to week 30, you see these high numbers? The 533 for the 2.5 to 4 magnitude earthquakes in week 27. Following, you see the 7 here and the 7 here, following these pair of 7s that came through. So we saw 21 in week 23. And that, for the five magnitude earthquakes, and that number jumped up to 28, which we had this week, and 29, and 32, and 30, before reaching our sub-20 uh, values at outside orbit position. So this pattern has persisted since the beginning, and this gives us a strong signal that we're reaching at outside orbit position. So don't be surprised if you see larger numbers, the fives that are in the now in the 20s, don't be surprised if they don't jump up into the 30s. And... Uh, a lot of threes, even in 2015, 2014, three six-magnitude earthquakes, and then nothing for a week.